Hello everyone, I'm Moira Shuri. Welcome to Zocalo Public Square, a creative unit of Arizona State University. This entire series has also been made possible by a generous contribution from the Consulate General of Canada. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and convene events just like this one. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. We have come to the finale of our partnership with the University of Toronto, and we want to leave you with a question that sparks meaningful conversation way beyond today's event. At times like these, we at Zocalo turn to Joe Matthews, the co-president of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, and his weekly column for Zocalo Public Square is read by over 3 million Californians. Joe's career began at the Baltimore Sun. He worked at the Wall Street Journal, where he covered the Justice Department, and then at the LA Times, where for several years he covered state and presidential politics, labor, education, and the city of Compton. Over to you, Joe. Um, hello. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and welcome uh, to Zocalo Public Square and this uh, Zocalo uh, University of Toronto, The World We Want uh, series events. Uh, can we still find the, the good in the world um, in the context of uh, a time of great difficulty um, for people and our planet? Um, I am, uh, I'm, 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 very pleased to be joined today by the Central European uh, University President Michael Gnachev. Um, Michael's uh, born in Canada, educated at the University of Toronto and Harvard. Um, um, he's a scholar, professor, writer, uh, former politician. Um, uh, major publications include The Needs of Strangers, Scar Tissue, Isaiah Berlin, The Rights Revolution, Human Rights as Politics and Idolatry, um, The Lesser Evil, uh, political Ethics in an Age of Terror, um, Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics, um, and uh, our favorite book here at Zocalo, The Ordinary Virtues, uh, Moral Order in a Divided World from 2017, uh, which won the Zocalo Book Prize. Um, um, some of you may remember Michael, uh, between 2006 and 2011, he was an MP in the Parliament of Canada, and then uh, leader of the Liberal Party in Canada, leader of the official opposition, and he is currently the rector and president, as I mentioned, of, of Central European University. Um, Michael, before we um, get more um, uh, deeply uh, into the, this, this big meaty question we have today, um, we're, we have a few fewer people, a couple fewer people, panelists than we expect in this event, and I, I, um, you, you, I wanted to give you the floor <laughs> um, to Say so you're here, it's, it's great to have you. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm the solo guest here. Some other guests who were gonna join us and I was looking forward to being with um, uh, dropped out for, for perfectly plausible reasons. And I think it's, oh, the audience, an explanation of why that's the case and why I'm still standing. Um, since I agreed to come on this program with you, Joe, and I did so happily because Zocalo is a wonderful institution and I think Canadians ought to know more about it. And I had a wonderful time in Los Angeles and saw the fantastic work that Zocalo does to create the kind of virtual and real public square for public discussion. And I thought it, it's, a, it's a great model. Um, so I accepted because of Zocalo and I accepted because it had a connection to U of T, which is my alma mater. But what's happened is that uh, many people have, have been in contact with me, colleagues and friends, people I deeply respect at the University of Toronto, wanting me to be aware that uh, the Canadian Association of University Teachers has censured the University of Toronto for a, a recent episode in which a, um, a candidate for a appointment at the law school um, uh, excess outside influence was exerted on this candidate uh, on this candidacy um, and this candidate who had every 
qualification to be appointed to this law school appointment, didn't get the appointment, the appointment was withdrawn. And um, in the uproar that followed, uh, it appears that some influence was exerted on the law school and uh, the central administration uh, also uh, uh, did not uh, uphold the basic standards of institutional autonomy and academic freedom. What do, what do those mean? Institutional autonomy means a university has to make appointments free of external interference from donors, from political groups, from anybody. This is an academic decision that has to be made in the House on strictly academic grounds. And the claim was that this candidate uh, was fully qualified for this post. Um, so that's the first problem, infringement of institutional autonomy. But institutional autonomy is the condition for academic freedom. Um, academics can't be free to write and publish and be hired and be promoted unless those decisions are entirely free from external interference. And there is some evidence that uh, external influence was brought to bear on this appointment in a proper way. And many of my friends and colleagues at the University of Toronto were outraged. Uh, and the Canadian Association of University Teachers then censured the university. <clears throat> and I support uh, the criticism of my alma mater. It pains me to say so, because I owe tremendous lot to the U of T. Um, got my start there, wonderful place. And, and for Canada, our, without any question, our, 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 our greatest university. Um, but they got it wrong here. The law school got it wrong. I think the central administration made mistakes. Um, <clears throat> but then the question becomes, why am I here? Why shouldn't I just you know, walk off like some of the other people who for perfectly legitimate reasons said they don't want to show up because they don't want to be associated with this controversy and they don't want to appear to, you know, to approve of what the University of Toronto did. And I respect that position, but I respectfully, you know, disagree in, and I've had very strong emails with close friends of the U of T about this that today, in fact. Um, I just think that um, in a entirely legitimate censure and protest against a university for getting its fundamental values wrong, there is a risk that if you censure and then have no public events at the U of T where, you know, external people can come in, the consequence may actually endanger the value that you want to defend, namely academic freedom. Because what does academic def freedom depend on? It depends on the public square. It depends on discussion and debate. And that's why I felt respectfully I should show up. Um, and, you know, um, I would welcome comments and criticisms and People who think I shouldn't be there should be free to say what they feel, but I, I kind of feel, show up. and let me tell you one final reason why I care about this, because I led a university, I'm still leading a university that was thrown out of a country and had to defend its academic freedom, so, and its institutional autonomy. So I kind of know something about these values. We fought to defend them, uh, and we're still fighting to defend them. And the situation for academic freedom in the country where, CU has found it is dire. Uh, so we're, we're uh, talking about Hungary for those who may not know this story. Yes, I don't. I don't want to be obscure. CU, yeah. uh, yeah. Central European University, was founded in 1991, established in Hungary, and was thrown out of Hungary by the Viktor Orban regime. And we are now in Vienna, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Vienna. So enough, enough of my speech. Okay. Uh, I hope that just clarifies why I've decided to be here. I, I appreciate that, and um, it was not something I was aware of. I'm a, a California innovation editor and California columnist, so I learned all about this uh, late last night driving back from a, a afternoon and evening of reporting in the, the western part of the Central Valley, which is the oil patch. So I was looking at oil derricks all day when this came upon me about nine o'clock last night. Um, thank you for that explanation. Let's let's go into it. Um, this is a big question, but... Um, can we, can we still um, see the good in the world? Can we still find the good in the world, I should say? Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking that I could move the discussion along by defining uh, what is meant by the good. Um, and then I started to think about, well, what is the good? And, and if you'll pardon me, my, the two 
people come to mind when someone uses the phrase the good. Um, I'm not sure they were terribly helpful to defining it. Um, first, uh, you know, as this uh, California columnist that spends a lot of time in local governments on cities, uh, you spend a lot of time in studying cities and how they work too. Um, I think of a local, immediately think of a local uh, California uh, elected official, um, former mayor of Carmel by the Sea, California, Clint Eastwood, um, and his role as sort of a nameless bounty hunter representing the good in Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Western, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but that particular vision of what it means to be good, you know, is marked by violence, and I'm not sure that I'm not sure that is what we mean by the good. Um, and then, you know, once I'm done thinking about Clint Eastwood, uh, I think about Plato um, and the Republic, um, naturally after Clint Eastwood, um, and the the form of the form of the good in in uh, in, in a dialogue in the Republic. Um, but you know, and I found it confusing. I remember confronting the Republican College for the first time. I'm not sure I'm clear on it now. Um, but the view of the good there is um, um, it's really hard. I mean, it's it's almost divine. Sort of, it's a perfect, eternal, changeless form. It's the you know, it's the it's the big star of the forms in the Republic. I mean, I guess the Clint Eastwood of forms, and and. And it's, it's hard to access, relate to, I mean, in some ways to be up against that kind of a, of a perfect eternal changeless good is, I mean, it's almost inhuman. It's, it's sort of awful. So I um, completely stumped. Um, I ask you, what do you, how should we think about the good? How might we define it? Oh boy, oh boy. Um, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta work tonight. Um, look, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, right? Uh, Clint Eastwood, I love Clint Eastwood as an actor, but I'm not gonna take lessons from Clint. Um, but I, I would say this, um, I think a Canadian's answer to the question, and my answer to the question is, um, let's not talk about good, let's talk about better. That is, I, I, I think that the platonic ideal of the good is kind of gonna be really difficult for us. Um, and. Uh, there are a lot of religious meanings to the good. There are a lot of um, Greek philosophical ideas of the good. I, I think what is critical in thinking about the good is thinking about better. And I think the minute you think about better and you apply better to the world we live in, we can all think pretty clearly about what needs to be better. Um, you've got your list, I've got mine. And, um, and I think we need to focus hard on, on better but the question behind this, which is what we started with, is how do we find the good or why is the good so hard to find? I, I think there um, we need to think about why it's so hard to think about better, why it's so hard to do better, why it's so hard to achieve better, why we're so goddamn depressed, excuse my language, why everybody isn't, there's a kind of mood of pessimism and disillusion about the very possibilities of better um, that I think we need to address. I mean, I've got some thoughts about that, but I'm, um, <clears throat> and the challenge, if you, if you want to address the pattern of disillusion and the pattern of despair and the perpetual sense of crisis and the perpetual sense of hopelessness that is so much part of the ambient rhetoric, um, if you address that, that what I immediately discover is that I end up sounding kind of ridiculously cheerful and hopeful in a kind of stupid, empty way. And we don't want to do that either, right? So, so this is where the problem is to me. How do you think about better? And then how do you think about it in a realistic way that doesn't sound kind of simplistic and stupid and needlessly hopeful? Because we do have real problems that we, I don't even need to name them. We know what some of these things are, and we know what would be better uh, for many of our, of our people. But the test finally about better is, it's a social good here. It's better, you know, I'm not looking for better for me because life has been good to me. I'm looking for better for, you know, my fellow, my fellow citizens. I'm Because I look out my window and I see a lot of stuff that's just terrible. People, you know, hope dashed, uh, kids whose lives stop before they've even started, um, 
environmental uh, pressures that threaten the very idea of a future. I could go on. So it's better for us, for human beings, for our fellow human beings that matter. And um, I think we need to think about that. And, and, and when you do that, then you get pretty clear about what the good is. The good is, you know, you know, millions of children not going hungry at night. The good is, you know, every kid who wants to getting a good education. I mean, the, the good is judging people, you know, Martin Luther King, judging people by the, their character, not by their looks or their ethnicity, their race. I mean, there's some, there's, there's some goods that we've known for a long time, and I, I, I think we see them clearly. What bothers me is an ambient hopelessness about how to get there um, as being the real issue we need to think about. Let me, let me get to the, the question. I mean, we're, we're obviously in a global pandemic um, where there's been a lot of terrible and tragic and ongoing um, deaths in the millions, um, uh, terrible disruptions of people's lives, people confined and, and struggling with all kinds of challenges, sort of domestic violence and mental health. Um, you know, um, I mean, is it wrong? You know, I mean, I can, I mean, I think, you know, I'm a journalist, I can see silver linings in the pandemic, you know, in this country, the, um, the impact of um, these, you know, huge pandemic era investments, uh, and, and, and cash, the checks going out the door have had really positive impacts in some very poor places in the United States um, that are surprising. But it does seem I mean, I feel guilt. I, I mean, a sort of a questioning of, I'm, am I saying the wrong thing to in the midst of that kind of crisis to be looking for the good? Am I, is that the right use of my time and my attention? Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, COVID-19 has been a human catastrophe. I mean, I, you know, we all have stand in silence for many minutes to remember the people who are not with us. And there may be people watching this who lost, lost loved ones. I mean, and and I, I think there's a category, I've just written a book about consolation. There's a, there's a category of the unconsolable. There's some losses that people may be watching this program that have suffered for which they cannot fully recover. They lost their mom, they lost their dad, they lost their child. I mean, you know, this stuff. Uh, and, and let's honor that and respect that and not walk past it. But it is equally true as a historical phenomenon that there's never been a pandemic in the history of the human race for which recovery was faster. There has never been a pandemic in history in which between you know, late January when the DNA of this thing was sequenced in China to when we had a provable vaccine solution was basically a year. It never happened in the history of the human race. And that's the result of enormous amount of, of real scientific progress. The point about it is it doesn't console anybody who's lost a loved one. And so we have to hold in our hands, in our minds, two very complicated thoughts, which is that there is consolation from the historical progress that science has made because it's literally saved some of the lives of the people who may be watching this program. But it means it does not console or alleviate the suffering of those who've lost someone. And, and we, we just have to, what we can't do is, and I see this sometimes in accounts of in human progress, people are saying, snap out of it, wake up, progress. We're making progress everywhere. Why are you so glum? Why are you so cheerful? Why, why aren't you more cheerful? That's missing the point because the loss that people suffer uh, is a loss for which no consolation is possible. And somehow when we tout the language of progress, we miss the ways in which it doesn't speak to loss. And there has been a heck of a lot of loss in Canada and the United States in the last 15 months. And we've learned some very painful things about ourselves. I, I do think that we've learned a couple of things that do take us closer to the good. And they have to do with the absolute necessity of having public goods provision so people don't die of stuff like this. 
We have to invest in healthcare for all of our people. That's an electric issue in the United States. I'm not going to go there, but I, you know, I just think that's a good, an unequivocal good that ought to be on the floor of every society. And everybody gets a jab and every government stockpiles the stuff we need to protect people. And we need truth and full disclosure in our political communications. And we've had some great examples of people telling us the truth, even when we didn't want to hear it. And that's a good, truth is good. And we've had some lamentable, dangerous, life endangering, lying from political leaders that we'll, we should never forget. And, and so it's really taught us a lot. I don't, again, want to take cheerful messages from this, but we need to. Uh, because otherwise it's just pure loss. Do you think, I, I don't want to change the context slightly to a different crisis, existential crisis of climate, but do you think that in reckoning with that as a, as a society, as a species globally, do you need, do you, is it a requirement to be able to see the good in this existential threat? Mm-hmm. Does it slow us down? I, I think uh, we had a, piece recently at Zocalo, fairly recently, from a professor who, um, at American University, who was teaching about climate and, and confronting the, the sort of the despair and negativity of her students, and deeply worried about that, um, about the subject and about, you know, their particular age and the timing of, of these growing effects. I mean, do you need to see the good to do that? Or is the, could the good be a distraction? from the more urgent sort of sense of emergency since we're not, we don't seem to be as a species moving fast enough uh, on this. Sure, I, I, you know, this is a really complicated issue uh, because I hate the environmental pessimism around me. I hate all this stuff that says you got 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. I hate all this stuff that says nothing we've done so far makes any damn difference. I hate all this stuff that says all the little things we do like recycling and you know shifting away from meat to vegetarian dishes. None of, none of these little activities matter because we're all gonna die and we're all doomed. I hate all that stuff to be frank because I, I, I think that the good we need to focus on um, is the capacity of human beings to, to master and control fate you know, to get fate under control. Um, uh, the environmental catastrophe is not a fate. We can avoid it. We can steer the ship better. Um, you know, here's where being as old as I am, and I'm in my 70s, adds a perspective I think we need. And I have this argument with my students because the students are depressed they are pessimistic and they are doubtful that we have any future at all. But if you start where I start, I was a graduate student in 1970 as a young person, and that was the first Earth Day in 1970. The, the global expansion of knowledge and generalized consciousness of how the environment works and how we harm it has risen exponentially in my lifetime. Every single person on this program in the, in, in the developed world with any education knows something about the ecosphere, the ecosystem, the environmental system, and the damages we're doing. That consciousness did not exist 50 years ago. Now, yes, we're not moving quickly enough, but we, and we need desperately a politics that captures that knowledge, channels it towards realizable, achievable goals. But, you know, I'm impatient with people who try to scare me and terrify me and depress me in politics. <laughs> I just don't think it's the right way to do this. I think the right way to do this is to appeal to, yes, the good in people. To say, listen, what kind of future do you want for your kids? And then be honest enough to deal with people who have difficulty with a lot of the green agenda. Because the other issue about this that I feel very strongly about if we're talking about the good is the good is political. 
The good is not a non-negotiable thing that we all have to bow down in front of. And the issue that I see in environmental politics is that it's not a politics. It doesn't want to talk to the people who have a problem with, you know, um, uh, emission controls and, and this and that. Speaking of Canada, you know, environmental politics is the most toxic and difficult political issue we face as a country because it pits one region of our country against another. It pits Aboriginal Canadians against not. I mean, it's intensely divisive. So instead of having a politics that says, you must all surrender to the obligation to save our planet and no further argument is necessary, you in fact need something completely different, which is a politics in which we sit down as Canadians and figure out how we trade off these goods and get them. Because the good is political, Joe. That's what I'm trying to say. And we have to argue out what we're prepared to do to achieve it, as opposed to pronouncing anathema on everybody who doesn't happen to sign up to a particular set of green credentials. And, and don't misunderstand me. I don't want to minimize the threat we face. I, we are running out of time. My generation, let me be clear, has not done the job. I will say, however, as a very failed politician, I did run on a carbon tax in 2007. I did, I did put my money <laughs> where my mouth is on this one. And we got beat. We lost seats. People forget this because we went with a, with, with a carbon tax. I still think it's the right thing to do. I do it again. But we lost. And we have to understand that this is tremendous work of political persuasion we have to do, as opposed to pronouncing anathema on everybody who disagrees with us. I mean, as someone who tried democratic politics and, and um, went back to um, academic politics, which, you know, as we were reminded again today, are not easy politics. Um, you have, you see the good in our democratic politics. You ha have you know, you have experience with the rise of populist authoritarianism, personal experience. I mean, where do you see the good in a, in a, in a global politics that allows us to advance on big crises to, you know, where is I, that good? I think the great thing about politics is speaking personally, and I, everybody, every Canadian on this call knows how bad I was as a politician. And I, I, but what I learned from it was it got me out of the bubble. It got me out of the bubble of, you know, the academic world. It got me out of the bubble of the basically white upper middle class world in which I'd lived my life. And that's the great thing about democratic politics. You meet the whole world. You meet people with radically different life experiences, radically different religious, ethnic, racial histories, and you've got to somehow bring everybody into the tent to believe a few things together and get some things done together. That's what democratic politics is in every one of our countries. And it's a, it, is the, it is the key to holding us together and achieving any kind of good at all. But it's extremely difficult. And, it's, and, and there is a counter politics, uh, a populist politics, that instead of bringing people together says, let's pick an enemy. Let's pick an enemy. Let's pick some vulnerable group that we can we can glom in on and build a consensus against that person. Trump's politics was classic. Let's let's create an enemy and 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 rally our base. The politics that I dealt with in Hungary was very similar. Let's make an enemy. It happened to be the founder of my university, George Soros. Holocaust survivor, Jewish cosmopolitan speculator, ruiner of Hungarian lives. I could go on with a de demonization that occurred. But this stuff, this politics, the politics of enemies is fatal to democracy. Uh, ultimately, this is the force that destroys any capacity we have to find the good. And let's not be purist about this, Joe. Politics is conflict. Politics is a battle. Politics is conflictual. You got to throw a punch. You got to take a punch. But you got to get people in the room to share your vision. And they are not the people you may have started with. They may not the people you understand, but they're the people you need to rally around a limited, highly political conception of the good that commands 
a majority of, of support. That's how democracy works. And look, it's slow. It doesn't work very well. But, you know, if I have to choose who the 21st century will belong to, it will not belong to Xi Jinping and the Chinese regime. It will not belong to Vladimir Putin. It will not belong to Erdogan of Turkey. It will not belong to Viktor Orban. It will belong to all those much despised democratic schleppers who, you know, hold power for a while and make dubious compromise and get people in the tent and, you know, pass it on to the next guy. That's the system that I'm betting on. So how do we manage that in our, in our daily lives and interactions? I mean, um, you know, um, we're often asked to separate, to stand down, to denounce um, people. Um, I, I, I feel this pressure even in internal family dynamics. I've got relatives who were big Trump supporters. I'm, I still love them. I'm still going to see them. I, I don't, I'm not going to, um, you know, to you know, still go to the, their house for Thanksgiving and in, in San Bernardino County here in California. I, I, I just, I, I, it maybe it, that doesn't matter to me or that maybe that's a privilege. Um, I mean, I'm struck by one of the things I, here, let me give you a situation as someone, you someone who's gone into places that are troubled places and looked and found the good in them from the favelas in Brazil to um, troubled parts of Los Angeles in your, in your book, The Ordinary Virtues. I, I, the column I've written in the last five years that got the most angry and still, I still get hate mail about it from people who find it. I wrote, I, I wrote a column about a church in the city of Redding, California, the very North part of our central Valley. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, church that doesn't follow normal Christian traditions, but has as 12,000 members of the 90, 12,000 of the 90,000 residents of Reading are members of it. Um, it does faith healings. It preaches miracles. It has a, a school of supernatural um, uh, ministry that recruits people from all over the world. Um, but I write often about uh, community and civic engagement and it and its members are geniuses at civic engagement. They are a model. They, they when the, there were layoffs in the city, they stepped in to raise money to make sure that the people the in city planning and the police department wouldn't be laid off. They saved the old theater. They saved the auditorium. When when the, the trails along the Sacramento River are dirty, you know, you call the church and immediately they're clean. The the people and the and all these folks who. Um, who came from all over the world, every corner of the world, to try to make miracles at the supernatural theology and, and figure out that they're uh, not miracle workers, have started businesses and nonprofits and that are impacting every part of life in a positive way in Reading. Uh, but yet, because they do some very strange things and they have a social conservative politics that, um, that I don't much like, that's hostile to, I see as hostile to LGBT people, um, you know, it's not on the same side of the abortion issue, so important in the United States as I am, um, you know, and a lot of my readers are. Um, I've been denounced. I've, I've somehow validated them by writing about, by seeing the good and what the good parts of what they do. How do you reckon with a situation like that? Should I be ashamed? Should I not have written that column? Um, you know, uh, what, 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 Joe, you should definitely wear sackcloth and ashes and apologize for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you're raising uh, very complex issues because, um, you know, on the on the liberal secular side of this, there there's a view that there's a certain kind of civil society organization that rallies for progressive social change, and that's really the only kind of from the grassroots social change that we really like. Well, the uncomfortable reality is that there are many churches, many religious communities, not just in the Christian side, but you know, I've been to countless um, Sikh temples, uh, Muslim uh, 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 gatherings, um, right across the spectrum, people of faith often do astounding bits of community mobilization and community service. <clears throat> and then they have views that a secular liberal like myself has trouble with in relation to women's rights, in relation to LGBT. Um, I just think 
it takes all kinds, you know, it takes, I mean, getting back to the question of the good, is it good that you have a community that cleans up those trails? You bet. Is it good that you have a religious community that, you know, helps the police force or provides, you know, community service uh, to people who have addiction problems? You bet it's a good idea. Um, you don't have to approve or believe or agree with everything they have to say. And they, for their part, have an obligation not to pronounce you as, you know, the Antichrist and, you know, you know, pronounce anathema on people who don't happen to believe in, um, in God or the, the promise of redemption. We, you know, the, this is one of the most explosive tensions in modern societies. It's been going on for hundreds of years. We have to live, those who believe and those who do not have to live and share the same planet, the same space, the same community. And we have to we have to agree to disagree in robust but but clear ways. You're, you're never going to convince uh, some of these folks uh, to abandon their religious their their views about certain social issues. I mean, I think you should try. I think there's some very courageous gay men and women in the United States who brought incredible change to their confessional community simply by saying, "Look at me. You know, am I not a human being just like you?" Do, do, do I not understand love exactly the same way that you? And that kind of heart-to-heart -heart conversion that minority communities have done have changed these communities. Why do we have gay marriage sanctified in the United States? It's because a lot of conversations went on between people who don't hold the same view. One of the most touching ceremonies I've ever been to in my life was in Iowa. Uh, I was asked to officiate at the marriage of two wonderful friends of mine who happened to be men and wanted to get married. And they wanted to get married on their dad's farm. And you know, I'm in the middle of an Iowa cornfield with people who have real difficulty religiously and doctrinally with, um, with uh, gay identity and, and with the sacrament of marriage and who it belongs to. And it was one of the great marriages I've ever been to. Because somehow people said, what matters here? <laughs> what is it that matters? These two men love each other. They love each other. It's enduring, passionate love. They respect the values of their parents. They respect the values of Iowa. They respect the values of everybody in the room. They just love each other. So <laughs> let's make this happen, you know? You know, so this kind of, this is where the good emerges. Uh, so this, this is the kind of work we have to do. We can't leave it to anybody else. There's got to be a moment when uh, we, 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 we come together and speak together and talk together and argue it out and, and agree. You said earlier you had people in your family who vote differently. The other key the other key message in terms of finding the good is not everything is political. Not everything is political, which means specifically that somebody who votes Trump is not Trump all the way down. He's also a human being or she's a human being with a whole set of views. And, and so the excessive politicization of identity is fatal to brotherhood, to solidarity, to love, companionship, all the things we value. I've been in politics and my view of politics is you want to keep it in a box. You know, it, it's important. We have to have a politics, but it cannot be allowed to define every choice and every value we have. And if it does that, that will destroy the good. Um, if you'll forgive me um, um, and being, uh, maybe this is too Christian centric, but I, there was some, um, just thinking about this, I, I found myself turning to um, you know, the gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 30, um, to read it, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came when the man was, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. That, of course, is the, you know, the, the famous, the, the good Samaritan. Um, but, you know, I wonder if I don't hear the good Samaritan invoked as often as I once did. Maybe that's a perception. Um, the good Samaritan is just solving one problem, you know, and, and um, of the person that they see in front of them. Great. But there's, there's an obligation now, which we're aware of, um, you know, and certainly was a big part of the conversation in the United States and around the world last year, that there are, that we are part of larger systems um, that are oppressive, racist, um, and that need to be changed. And um, I mean, is the Good Samaritan old fashioned? Is it, is it, do we, we, we need more from the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan has to do more in this context. Am I wrong? I mean, and, and that's much harder. I mean, you know, as, 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 as not that everyone did it, but it's much harder to build a system. I, I don't, I, no one taught me to, to build a system, um, you know, when I was studying social studies or journalism. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we had Luke in the conversation um, <laughs> because it allows you to make a point here. You know, we're in such deep trouble in this world, is my view, that we need all the help we can get. And that help includes um, the great religious texts. Um, you don't have to buy every single aspect of Christian doctrine, but you can certainly turn to the Gospels. You can turn to the Epistles, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, we are in such deep trouble that we need the wisdom of the Quran. We need the wisdom of the great uh, Sikh texts. We need the, the tr unbelievable surpassing wisdom of the Jewish tradition. I mean, that's my view. And, and, and it, it's not as empty as it sounds. That is, there's a kind of secular conceit that we're marooned in the 21st century and we have to find the good with purely secular language and secular traditions. I just don't believe that. I think there isn't a person alive who listened to you recite that verse, those verses of Luke who doesn't understand what that story is about. And that story is replicated in many other traditions, both secular and religious. And my sense of our problem about the good is that we have willfully abandoned forms of ancient wisdom for, direct, for doctrinal reasons and for reasons of identity. And we don't need to do this. You know, I, I got the Bible on my shelf. I, you know, my brother is a believer. I'm not, um, who cares, frankly? We, we, need, we, need this, we need this ancient wisdom and we need to be constantly recircling and, and, and using it because I don't, the thing I don't feel, um, we're not alone. I, I think the thing I passionately believe is we've never been alone. Um, the conversation you and I have been having is 21st century, but it's been going on for, you know, 3,000 years. So we might as well listen to some of the smarter people who went before us and who paid often in terrible suffering for what they learned to know. And, and if we all had a sense that there's an archive, a usable archive of ancient wisdom, uh, I think that would help us. Uh, and it would narrow some of our disagreements. We would discover uh, commonalities of, of origin, commonalities of inspiration that run beneath our differences. And I think that would help us quite a bit. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's part of why, it's part of why I'm, I'm, I'm not an optimist, but I'm hopeful because I, I don't think we're alone. I think we are shadowed by ancient wisdom and we can turn to it any time. And, and you know, I, I teach in a university, what do I do? I take out a great book, I put it in front of the kids and I say, read the damn thing. This is how you think. This is how you know and understand what the good is. And let's have an argument, let's have a discussion about it. And this is this practice of, of a person like me talking to someone younger about a great book has been going on for 3000 years and it needs to go on for the next 3000 years because that's how the good gets known and gets transmitted and gets passed on. 
It's not doctrine, it's not ideology, it's an individual search in which two people help each other to figure out the way forward. Um, I want to turn to the audience questions, many good ones in the in the chat. Um, um, one right away, um, can you recommend any books, um, films or works of art that you think offer particularly interesting insights into the good? Oh boy. Um, I could think of a hundred and it's a great question. I, I'd actually send you into a, onto the, onto the websites and, and just look at the Rembrandt self-portraits. Just look at a man searching for himself and depicting himself over a lifetime. There are books that collects these self-portraits. They're so interesting. Um, they don't, they don't elucidate the good, but they, they show a process of a, of a great man, a great artist, a heroic artist, trying to find out what it is to be a human being. It, it, it wasn't just a search about me, Rembrandt van Rijn. It, it, it's a search that he uses himself to find out what it is to be a human being. And you can't stand in front of these self-portraits without a Without, without a sense of recognition and a sense of also deep admiration for his courage and steadfastness in that search. So just off the top of my head, that would be my slightly strange answer to your excellent question. I, I couldn't help but think and answer that question of a different kind of comment on goodness. Um, uh, the novels of the late Elmore Leonard, you know, oh, wow. the, yeah. the Dickens of Detroit. <laughs> You know, which play with the concept of the bad good, that there's, it's about people who are considered bad. They're criminals, they're mobsters, no. they're corrupt cops who no. have, do find ways to do good things. And then they're also very good people, often pious people who are, um, who are bad. You know, I think of, um, I no. think of Chili Palmer, the, the mobster who, um, uh, in Get Shorty, who, um, comes to Hollywood to collect a debt um, for the mob. There's some mob investment movie and ends up making a, a very, uh, writing a very morally complex screenplay. Um, so complex that the Hollywood producer um, tells him, you know, there's, no, there's nobody to sympathize with. Who's the good guy? Um, you know, um, there's a sort of comment on that and the appeal of the bad good to, uh, to us as humans. Uh, Seems to actually have a political. Uh, I'm a hundred percent with you on both of those, particularly Elmore Leonard. A very good, very good advice. Great. Cool. Um, here's another. Um, um, what responsibility uh, do educational institutions have for teaching young people about morality and the good? Mm -hmm. um, I think a considerable responsibility. I mean, you know, I. I was sitting in a Senate meeting in my university this afternoon reviewing the statutes on plagiarism. I mean, at the most simple basic level, um, any university, any high school, any primary school has to teach very important values of, of intellectual and academic honesty. You don't cheat. Um, you have to then teach people the distinction between a, you know, a fact and an opinion. Um, there's a whole morality to intellectual life that I think a great university has to teach. Um, uh, and, in, and, in, and in a period when we're all so damn certain of our opinions and stuff, it's very important that we have universities that kind of cut us down to size and say, well, you know, why are you arguing that? What, what's your evidence? Why do you know that? Why, why are you so certain of X, Y, and Z? You know, Professors need to go through that, students need to go through the, that, but I, I think that that ethical concern for being truthful uh, about facts and knowledge should be built into the core of, of, of um, primary school, secondary school, high school, universities, everything. And uh, you know, of all the things I learned at, in all of these institutions, that probably is the one that matters most. Um. A, a question um, from one, from an, again, audience member. Um, you earlier you were talking about um, minor steps we can take to get to the good. Um, what one thing could everyone do today that could help us get there? One actionable item. 
listen. Okay. Um, another question uh, from uh, more politics. Um, um, how do you draw constraints uh, around the thrust and parry of politics uh, when one leader ignores the conventions and attacks the opposition as the enemy? Um, that's again from the audience chat. Well, it's, uh, I've lived that one. Um, um, I've tried to make a distinction in my writing. It's a little between the politics of enemies and the politics of adversaries. All politics is conflictual. It's a battle over what is the public good. And so it should be sharp. And, um, but in a politics of adversaries, you recognize that your opponent could be your ally tomorrow. You recognize with an adversary that there's some limits to combat, uh, that it is not in your interest to press to the politics of personal destruction or personal invective because they'll turn it on you. So th there's a kind of um, mutual deterrent system that sets in on a politics of adversaries and is crucial to the stability of democratic politics. When that is replaced with a politics that says something is so important and so at stake that we must destroy this idea, this person, this party, this thing. Then you get a politics of enemies, which, which can end in the destruction of the, the political system itself. There were, there, I, 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 the thing that needs to be understood, I think about the January 6 events in the storming of the Capitol that is the most unsettling thing is that some of these people genuinely believed that the Republic was in danger. They genuinely believed that um, uh, they had to resist with violence, if necessary, um, a fraudulent election. This is where it ends. It ends with you have a, a demonized view, a, a, a highly uh, toxic intensity in your view of a political opponent that, in which you cease to see them as an adversary and a fellow citizen and you begin to see them as an enemy who is about to destroy everything that you, you put the highest value to. And that's a toxic emotion in politics. And on January 6th, I think we saw where it can, where it can lead. So, um, uh, it's, but let, let, let's get real about this. I've been in politics. You get stung, you get attacked, you're extremely tempted to take a shot. And sometimes you know something about your opponent you're strongly tempted to use. And what restrains you is the sense we could get into an escalation here that you can't control. So that tends to limit where you go. Uh, and I strongly believe we should always think of democratic politics as a battle of adversaries and not never as a battle with enemies. I just think there are no enemies in the democratic house except one. The, 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 one dem, the one enemy, genuine enemy in, a demo, in the democratic house is a person who used violence to achieve political ends. And that's why January 6th crossed the line. You simply cannot do that in politics. That has to be stopped by force immediately. But that's the only enemy I see in politics. It's not somebody who has, I think, crazy views about politics. It's not Mr. Trump. It's only the person who uses violence to achieve a political goal. That has to be stopped by everybody in the political system. Let me, uh, to follow that, another question from the, from the audience. What is good citizenship in the face of the evident potential of an authoritarian state in the United States? Do you ignore the possibility? Do you engage with it before it's too late? And I guess, so how would you, how do you engage it? Well, I, th I, I, I think we saw some extraordinary citizen mobilization. Um, let's remember the turnout at this election. That's citizen behavior. That's model civic behavior. American democracy was much criticized outside by the fact that, you know, Americans didn't bother to show up. Uh, Canadians used to sit there saying how much superior our democracy is to yours because we show up more often. And unfortunately, that's no longer true. Uh, you know, the basic rule of citizenship, you show up to vote. And people did show up in massive numbers on both sides of the 
coin in, in uh, 2020, which leads me to think that there's a democratic passion, a, a commitment to uh, sustaining the democratic system that should never be underestimated. You know, that's the basic. And then there are all kinds of other stuff. I mean, I, I, I think the other key rule is to defend the integrity of the political system to make sure that, you know, every citizen has the right to vote. And there's a ferocious battle in America at the present time about that. And I'm clearly in, in strongly in favor of every measure that makes it easier to vote um, for all categories of, of, of American citizens. Um, here's another question from the chat. What responsibilities do corporations have to, to do good? Um, um, especially those who've contributed to, you know, some of our problems and inequality, environmental degradation, you know, exploitation of, of people and resources. Um, well, I, I, again, we're, we're running the clock here. I just think, you know, stop yeah. lying would be a good start. I mean, I, 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 there isn't, I don't have an anti-corporate, anti-capitalist bone in my body, but I don't like people who lie to me. And I don't like it in politics and I don't like it in the corporate sector. You need transparency, disclosure, um, you know, if, uh, if an auto company uh, plays with its emission uh, statistics to create a false impression that it sells a more environmentally sustainable car, that's lying and it should be, it should be punished. Um, and you go right across the board, truth here is, is, a, is, is I think the key detergent. I also strongly believe that uh, corporations need to pay a fair portion of tax, and that's a very live debate at the moment, but uh, I, I just cannot believe that a country in such desperate need of infrastructure reconstruction can do it unless the corporate sector pays its fair share in taxation and those who run corporations pay their fair share. Because the legitimacy of the democratic system, let's add the, the heavy point here, that the legitimacy of the democratic system depends on everybody feeling that everybody is paying their fair share. So it's not simply a matter of tax avoidance being a kind of economic issue. It cuts to the heart of leg the legitimacy of the democratic system itself. Hmm. Okay, a final question. Um, this one's for me. Um, I had a, a boss, a high ranking boss when I was a reporter at the LA Times who liked to put his arm around me and always look at, and say, be good, be good was his motto. Um, and I should disclose, he's now the executive editor of the New York Times. So I have to be careful here. But, um, but you know, I always remember being profoundly bothered by the command to be good. And we get a lot of commands to be good. He didn't really want me to be good. He wanted me to get stories, even if it meant being sneaky, you know, even if it meant diving into the trash for, you know, the, the, the documents that had been thrown out, um, you know. The, how do we reckon with the command to be good? And I think the, the, the you know, the, all these things we must comply with, you know, you know, parrot this parrot propaganda, um, believe in this good cause. There's a sort of human tendency to rebel a little bit about that. Um, it can feel good to be a little bit bad. Yeah. How do you reckon with that particular thing? Should I have told him off? I didn't, you know, but it always bothered me when he said, be good, Matthews. I think it's difficult in a, in a setting like that. He seems to be giving a double message, you know, be good, but get me the story. I can see that is not, they don't actually fit very well. And I'm not sure it's a boss's job to tell you to be good, frankly. I just think it's that, that recommendation is bound to end in tears. I mean, uh, being good, it, it's, I think the one thing, let's say what good, being good isn't, I, I think it's not rule following. It's not, you know, here are the 10 commandments, I follow these 10 commandments, therefore I'm a good person. I, I think it's just, that's not what it is. It, this is about character. This is about the long haul, you know, being good means being the kind of person where the people you love most, the people you trust most, the people whose opinion matters to most to you say, he's a good guy, you know, by which they mean he's reliable. He tries to tell the truth. Um, you can count on him or her when the, when the bad stuff really happens. He's there when you're grieving. He's there 
she's there when you're you're having a really hard time. Uh, this person is not a saint. This person may curse, swear, may have all kinds of issues in their personal lives that you don't even approve of, but they're there for you. A lot of what we sense is a good person is someone who is there for you when it's tough, when it's difficult. Um, and I, I'm lucky to have a few people like that in my life. And, and it matters intensely to me that those people who are there for me know that I will be there for them. Do you know what I mean? And I, I <laughs> and it's an austere uh, requirement. I'm not sure I'm going to measure up to what I've just told you. I, I'd sure like to. And I think that's what I think a good person would be. Let's end it there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael Natyev, um, for making this possible um, uh, to our sponsors of the University of Toronto, to um, uh, the completing this, uh, the World We Want uh, series, um, and especially to all my colleagues at Oklahoma Public Square uh, for making this uh, event a success, despite some challenges uh, that are not usual. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, and uh, we will I look forward to, to our next event. Uh, you can join us. Um, I know for one thing next uh, next Thursday um, for an event. What makes a good small town, uh, which is part of our partnership with uh, uh, between Zocalo and the California Wellness Foundation, we'll have uh, current and former um, city officials from uh, West Sacramento, California, Coachella, California, and uh, the small town of Gonzales, California, talking about community and small town governments governance. We'll see you then and uh, best wishes to all. Thank you. Good night.